God's house this morning, and we're giving him glory today. How can we say thanks? We're missing a few, and we've gained a few. So we're glad you're here up to and including my in-laws. <laughs> so every man has trials and tribulations. <laughs> Most of the time, mine aren't very close, Max, but today they've gotten real personal. <laughs> and Randy and Jenny, thank you for coming to you. By way of announcement, uh, this Wednesday, I'm guessing 7, is the church's uh, business meeting, annual meeting. Uh, there are, I guess you'll be voting on a couple of bylaw changes if you need to read them there. I posted them some time ago. I got a text uh, yesterday. It says, Brother Nathan, I won't be at church tomorrow. There's a church in the north north end of town that doesn't have a pastor I'm going to help them out for now from Helen Ford and she so she let us know why she's not here and she's working I said you're welcome to come back anytime and she said thank you I enjoyed being in the church there so that's that's why Helen won't be here she's found a harvest field to work in and also Danny Williams texted me this morning and he may have sent word to several of you but he asked to pass the message on that Due to county restrictions in Los Angeles County, Palmdale Camp has been canceled. So we need to pray for our leaders. They are, it seems, doing some stupid things. We talked before church at the Supreme Court. Um, a deal from California was rejected, and churches lost some, some rights. We need to pray some liberal judges into retirement. And in the meantime, we need to have church and worship the Lord. So Brandon, come ahead and let's sing. Let's turn to number 236. 236. <laughs>
253. <clears throat> probably would behoove us to pray for the Williams family again this week in their time of loss. If nothing else, I'm sure we all have unspoken requests. Let's stand and we'll go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we come before you today. We are delighted in your presence. We are thrilled that you've seen fit to meet with us. We're thrilled for the songs, Lord, the songwriters of old that put truth down on paper and somebody had talent to put music to it. And we thank Man of Sorrows, what a, a name, and hallelujah, what a Savior. And I'll see my Savior first of all, and, and mercy and grace and pardon is so freely bestowed on all who ask. And Lord Jesus, the songs this morning have lifted our heart toward you, and we're thankful, Lord, that thou art on the throne, and we're thankful, Lord, that we've come before you, and we've said we're guilty, and you've given us a free pardon. And, Lord Jesus, we're just thankful this morning that we're your children, and your spirit resides within, and that you've seen fit to come and meet with us. 
We pray today, Lord, that you would continue to help in this service. We pray, oh God, that nothing would be said or done that displeased you, that the Holy Spirit would not become offended because of self or self-righteousness or ignorance or anything, Lord, but that your presence would continue here. We pray today for the needs that we've, we've mentioned. We think of the unspoken request of Johnny and Dee. I don't know what it is, Lord, but you do. And we pray, oh God, in your divineness that you would meet that need, whatever it is. Lord Jesus, I'm sure that among everybody there's needs and requests that are unspoken this morning, needs that you know about, needs that you're concerned about. And Lord Jesus, we would bring them before you today. We pray, oh God, for the members and the ones of our church who aren't here today, Lord. We pray that whatever the hindering cause, you would help and you would meet the needs and, and you would convict where necessary and you would, you would, uh, you would help and prick and, and guide and guard and we would pray for those who aren't here. We pray today, Jesus, that you would be with the Danny Williams family in their time of loss. He said, how much more can they take? And we pray, oh God, that you would help them and strengthen them. And Lord Jesus, I pray that you would give him a special touch this morning as, as he has to grieve and yet preach. We pray, Lord, that you would help him today. We pray for Jennifer, Lord. You know the need of her heart. It seems that you're burning her barley field trying to draw her to yourself. And we pray, oh God, that you would heed the call and yield to you. We pray today, Jesus, that you would be with uh, Roberto and Carolina and the new baby that's coming. Lord Jesus, we're thankful for Brianna and that she has a hunger to come to church. And we're thankful for her smile and we're thankful for her talent. And we're thankful, Jesus, for her. And we pray for her mother and dad today and her siblings. We pray, oh God, that you would help in that home. We're trusting you, Lord, that they'll be able to come out to church this evening and, and that your spirit will be here and woo and draw and they'll be able to, to know what it's like to feel the spirit of God. We pray today, Lord, for uh, Brandon and Marky as they're house shopping. Lord Jesus, it's a big deal to buy a place that's, that, 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 that's the biggest purchase most of us ever make. And we pray, oh God, that you'll give them wisdom and guidance and direction. We know what it's like, Lord, to have perfect, total, complete, and genuine peace on a decision and to walk in faith and trust. And Lord Jesus, we pray that you would help them today. We're, we've not give up, Lord, on the fact that you've not answered prayer for Marky. Lord Jesus, we haven't give up on the fact that you've not done what you said because we did what you said. And Lord, we're trusting you today to come through for us. Lord, we're trusting you to come through for us. We did it like you asked. And your yes, honor's on amen. the line again today, Lord, that you would heal her of that disease and that plague that bothers her every day. Lord Jesus, we've not forgot, and we know you haven't forgot because you put it in your word, and we just did what you said. We pray today, Lord, for Hannah. We trust, Lord, that you'll help her Wednesday as she takes her state boards. We pray, oh God, that you'll help her to remember what she's learned. We pray, Lord, that you'll help to calm her nerves and meet her need. We pray that you'll help her in that test. And then, Lord, as she prepares for a pacemaker in June, we pray that you would be with the doctors and give them steady hands and a keen mind and give her calmness and peace in her heart. We pray today for Hannah. We thank you, Lord, for all the good things of life. We pray, Jesus, that you would be uh, with our nation today. We pray, Lord, that you would deliver us from wicked and unreasonable men. We pray that you would take out John Roberts from the Supreme Court and take out some of those other liberals up there, Lord, that are no good for Christianity and no good for freedom of religion and no good for the things that please you. And we pray, oh God, that whatever you need to do to retire them from that bench and put good men or women in their place, you would do it and we'll thank you for it. Again, Jesus, we ask you to continue in this service. Please help. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your son that was willing to die. We're thankful people today, Jesus, because you've met with us. Amen. Amen. Let's turn to number 275. 275.
think if the Seasters will come ahead, we'll have your special now, please. <laughs>
I sense God's presence here today Amen. in a very real way. I don't want us to miss whatever it is he has for us. First Samuel chapter 10 is where we're going to start. Thank you all for that singing. If you like to come back tonight, there will be more. <laughs> First Samuel chapter 10. Reading in verse 6. And the Spirit of the Lord will come upon thee. And thou shalt prophesy with them, and shalt be turned into another man. And let it be, when thou, these signs are come unto thee, that thou do as occasion serve thee, for God is with thee. And thou shalt go down before me to Gilgal, and behold, I will come down unto thee to offer burnt offerings, and to sacrifice sacrifices of peace offerings. Seven days shalt thou tarry, till I come to thee, and show thee what thou shalt do. And it was so that when he had turned his back to go from Samuel, saw God gave him another heart, and all those signs came to pass that day. And when they came thither to the hill, behold, a company of prophets met him, and the Spirit of God came upon him, and he prophesied among them. We kind of broke into the middle here of the account of when Saul is going to become the king. The people have sinned, they've, they've rejected God's leadership, and they want a king to rule over them. God has told Samuel, they've not rejected you, they've rejected me. Give them a king, and Saul is to be the new king. So we all know the story, Saul's been on an errand for his dad, the donkeys are gone, and so he's out hunting them, and ultimately he meets Samuel, and is told what is in store, and is heading back home when this occurs. Verse 6, he's headed home, and he's told, The Spirit of the Lord will come upon thee, and thou shalt prophesy. In verse 9 it said, And it was so that when he had turned his back to go from Samuel, God gave him another heart, and all those signs came to pass that day. So we see Samuel, we see that, er, yeah, see Samuel has, has told Saul what's going to happen. And it does, and Saul has another heart. Now jump with me to 1 Samuel chapter 28, and again read verse 6. And when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord answered him not, neither by dreams, nor by Urim, nor by prophets. How does a man go from having a changed heart and full of the Spirit to a position where the Lord will not hear him and will not answer. It isn't easy, but it is possible. So let's look at the life of Saul for a little while. We first become acquainted with Saul back in chapter 9 of 1 Samuel. We're told that Saul comes from the tribe of Benjamin. His father is a mighty man of power. We know that Saul must have been a good boy. We know that from the scripture that he was tall. In fact, according to chapter 9, verse 2, Saul was taller and goodlier than anyone else around. His very persona was one to be respected, and he had had nothing to do with that. Tall, short, fat, thin, bald, hairy, you can't help how you're born. That said, God used Saul's natural abilities in his plan. Saul came from a respectable home. His family was well-to-do. They had land and donkeys and servants and oxen. Saul's family took care of their stuff. Not only did they know that the donkeys were missing, they went and looked for them. Maintenance proves character. The other day we were leaving here and we drove up, or maybe it passed us up, maybe a 91 or 2 Chevrolet short bed step side, two wheel drive. Looked like the day it was new 30 years ago. I don't know who the guy was that owned it, but he has character. He took care of his stuff. 
Saul's family because they were looking for that and wanting to take care of it. We know that they were respectable and they were, they were people of character. We know that Saul must have been a responsible young man. No dad's going to send his son on a several day journey looking for donkeys if he wasn't a trusted kid. He wasn't just trustworthy and responsible. He was tenacious. Verse 4 says he passed through Mount Ephraim and passed through the land of Shalisha, but they found them not. Then they passed through the land of Shalem, and there they were not. And he passed through the land of Benjamin, but they found them not. He kept hunting. It wasn't just enough to, don't see him. No, he kept looking. Kept looking. He was, he was tenacious. <clears throat> Saul, true to his responsibility, though, we find as we read on, he knew when enough was enough, it was time to go home. He knew that his dad would quit worrying about the donkeys and start worrying about the boy, his son. And somewhere right in here, he's, he's telling the servant, we need to go home. Dad's going to start worrying about us. And the servant says, you know, there's a man of God in this place. Let's talk to him. I would have to pose the question for all their successes. Why had Saul not thought to look at the man of God or look for him? Just short rabbit trail. There's good people that don't know the good Lord. Back on the main track. Saul thought it was a good idea. Let's, let's go talk to him, but we don't have anything to take him. We don't have any gifts. Again and again and again, we're seeing glimpses of, in Saul's life of his character and, and what kind of a man he was and what kind of a family he had come from. To go without a gift was unthinkable. He was generous. He did not have an entitlement mentality. And so Saul and the servant came to Samuel and his destiny has changed forever. There's not going to be any going back now after he meets the prophet. Even today when people come face to face with God's plan, they can never go back. That's right. They can reject it. They can lose it. But they can't unlearn it. Forever, somebody is faced with the choice after they've ever heard it once. So now Saul's the man of the hour. He doesn't know it yet or even suspect it. But things are beginning to happen. Samuel begins to speak, telling Saul that he'll feast with him today and tomorrow. Samuel said, I'll tell you some things. Again, we'll see the character of Saul. And Saul answered and said, I'm in verse 21, Am not I a Benjaminite of the smallest of the tribes of Israel, and my family the least of all the families of the tribe? Wherefore then speakest thou so? Saul is genuinely humble. Don't you know that Saul felt like a hare and a biscuit at that table when it was time to eat? <laughs> he had the choice seats, he had the choice meats, and he had no choice but to eat. Then it was nighttime, and I suspect he didn't sleep much because the Bible says he rose early in the morning about the springing of the day. And so now comes the time where Samuel tells Saul several things, who he's going to meet and who he's gonna, what they're going to have and what they'll say. And, and more importantly, again, we'll read our text, and the Spirit of the Lord will come upon thee, and thou shalt prophesy with them and shall be turned into another man. The Spirit's going to come on you. You're going to be different. And let it be, verse 7, when these signs are coming to thee, that thou do as occasion serve thee, for God is with thee. The Spirit's going to come on you. Do as you're led. Obey. Saul has been promised the Spirit of God. In those days, that would have been an invaluable thing. Today, the Spirit is freely given. Jesus said, I'll go and I'll send the Comforter. He's here freely for us. All we have to do is ask. But for Saul, that was quite a gift. So now we've come back. Saul is filled with the Spirit. He prophesies as we've read. He goes home and he was prudent. He didn't tell everybody what Samuel had told him. He kept his mouth shut. He was prudent. He waited on Samuel down toward the rest of chapter 10. You'll read where Samuel comes and they decree that he's going to be king. Saul's going to be king. And where do we find him? The Bible says he's hiding among the stuff. He may be king, but he's still a bashful kid. He still has the same personality. But he's going to be king. And so then he leaves. 
verse 26 of chapter 10, And Saul also went home to Gibeah, and there went with him a band of men whose hearts God had touched. Saul had some good friends that went with him. And so many, many, many people have found themselves in this very spot. They've had a good raising. They've been taught to be responsible children and prudent adults and good citizens. They've had natural talents or abilities, but they, they've recognized that they're gifts and they haven't become arrogant or haughty because of, of their just natural abilities. This person, and it may be you or I, has worked hard at finding what it is we seek. For Saul, it was donkeys. For us, it's been who knows what. We've been tenacious. There's no quitting. There's no going back. We're going we're gonna to keep on. But we haven't found what we're seeking. We're still looking. And just when we've about to give up, someone suggested going God's way. What do we have to give the Lord, we question. Well, no price is enough, so let's give him ourself. And God tells us that all is well. What's lost has been found. Then his spirit comes and we have a change of heart. Now that analogy is not perfect, but you get the idea. <coughs> Many a person finds themselves, even maybe sitting here today, like Saul. They've had a change of heart. We wait on the Lord not knowing for sure the plan. Saul waited, but we're willing we choose our friends wisely, people that follow God, Saul did. So what was it that tripped Saul up? He had all of this. He had the world by the tail. What caused Saul to get tripped up? I think we can find some clues as we continue on. Chapter 13 starts, Saul reigned one year, and when he had reigned two years over Israel, time. Time started eroding Saul's character. The elapse of time, the zeal, the ambition, the whatever it was in Saul's life as time went on, we find that it was, it was losing out. His humbleness was being replaced with arrogance. It's whatever you say with my way. Saul was losing out because of time. Time was wearing him down. You think I'm wrong? Who would wear a new pair of shoes to get out in the cow lot? No, we'd wear old or time elapsed shoes. If you're going to paint, you put on old clothes. The ecstasy of our honeymoon has been replaced to woman, hurry. <laughs> you see a man hold a door on his car, it's either a new woman or a new car. Old car and old woman don't get the door held for them. Time began to drag Saul down. He had settled into his new normal. And what once it had a spring to his step, now he's just plodding along. Moving on to verse 2, Saul chose him 3,000 men of Israel. And if you go down there, it's down on into verse 6. It says, when the men of Israel saw that they were in strait, for the people were distressed, Saul has started having bad friends, bad associates. Time is dragging him down. His friends are dragging him down. Are you a man or a mouse, we might ask. These men sure weren't, they weren't men. Because the Bible says they hid in caves and thickets and rocks and high places and in pits. Cowards. Saul's friends are starting to pull him down. I've heard it said, you are right now or will soon become what your friends are. And that's not just for young people, that's for old people. You start hanging around folks that are gripey and snarky and snippy, and you will be too. His friends will begin to ruin him. On a side note, he chose 2,000. Down toward the end of the chapter, he numbers them. There's 600. Bad friends will leave you high and dry. <laughs> That's another short rabbit trail. And so Saul's friends are pulling him down. Time is working on him. His friends are working on him. Chapter 13, verses 8 and 9 says, And he tarried seven days according to the set time that Samuel had appointed, but Samuel came not. And so Saul said, Bring hither a burnt offering. Saul becomes, begins to be impatient. 
In the beginning, he was willing to wait the seven days. But not now. Saul takes matters into his own hand, his impatience, and then he says, I'll do it myself. Over and over throughout Scripture, we're admonished to have patience and to wait and to tarry and to dwell. God has a timetable that's different than ours. Which probably means if we're operating on our timetable, we're wrong. But time, the Scripture teaches us be patient. Saul was not patient. And then he took matters into his own hands. Do we ever see problems today from that? Well... The I'll do it my way attitude. Saul said, he's not coming, I'll do it my way. I'll offer that sacrifice. And he did. And this is the beginning of the end for Saul when that my way attitude started cropping up. He's fixing to cross the deadline, the point in a person's life when there's no more opportunity for salvation. The day of grace will be passed because of my way. So we find in verse 10, Samuel shows up. And he begins to question Saul. What have you done? In verse 11, it says, And Saul said, Because I saw the people that were scattered, and that thou camest not, and that the Philistines... Saul begins to make excuses Saul, if you ever want victory, you're going to have to own up to the fact you did wrong. Quit making excuses. Sound familiar? Millions of my way people are making excuses this morning. Samuel chastises Saul and tells him your kingdom will be given down to another. Saul did not fall down on his face and repent. No, the Bible tells us that Saul abode in Gibeah. Samuel rose and went up and Saul numbered the people and he basically went home. How many people this morning sitting in some church across this country are going to feel the prick of God on their soul? They're going to be in a service where the Spirit is moved and what are they going to do when they've been chastised and warned? Just going to go home. Amen. Ignore the warning. And slowly but surely they're sending away their opportunity for salvation. And just like for Saul, judgment is coming for them. So moving on through the life of Saul, we find in 1 Samuel 14 the beginnings of his jealousy and his meanness. And as sure as night follows day, if we quit pleasing God, we're going to get mean and jealous and have all kinds of ugly, sinful, carnal traits show up in our heart. Then we come to chapter 15, and it begins with another command, another opportunity to do right. Samuel said, go to the city of, of Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have. Destroy it all. Saul knew what he was to do, and yet, and he took Agag, the king of Amalek, alive, and utterly destroyed all the people. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and of the oxen, of the fatlings and of the lambs and all that was good and would not utterly destroy them. This my way Saul one more time said, I'll do it my way. My way. God had given him another opportunity to go and obey. And he still said, my way. And so what happens? We'll just read it. And when Samuel rose early to meet Saul in the morning, it was told Samuel, saying, Saul came to Carmel, and behold, he set him up a place, and has gone about, and pressed on, gone down to Gilgal. And Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said unto him, Blessed be thou of the Lord, I have performed the commandment of the Lord. And Samuel said, What meaneth then this bleeding of the sheep in mine ears, and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? And Saul said, They have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God, and the rest we have utterly destroyed. Then Samuel said unto Saul, Stay, and I will tell thee what the Lord hath said to me this night. And he said, Say on. And Samuel said, When that was little in thine own sight, wast thou not made the head of the tribes of Israel over the Lord? 
and the Lord anointed thee king over Israel. And the Lord set thee on his journey and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they be consumed. Wherefore then didst thou not obey the voice of the Lord, but didst fly upon the spoil, and didst evil in the sight of the Lord? And Saul said unto Samuel, Yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord, and have gone the way which the Lord sent me, and have brought Agag the king of Amalek, and have utterly destroyed. But the people took of the sheep and the spoil and oxen, the cheap things. Samuel said, Hath the Lord his great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices? As in to obey, behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness as I iniquity and idolatry because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord he hath also rejected thee from being king Samuel again confronts Saul and what do we see this time it's not just excuses it's blame shifting but the people but the people Saul you better own up the price you're fixing to pay is way too high but Saul didn't own it he blame shifted but the people Adam pulled that stunt in the garden. This woman you gave me. He blame shifted. But Saul's ruin was complete. He couldn't even own up to that fact that he had been rejected. In a last gasp at show, the Bible tells us that he had Samuel turn back so that he could uh, make a show of worshiping the Lord in front of the elders. Then he said, I have sinned, yet in honor me now. I pray thee before the elders of my people and turn again. He wanted to put on a pretense of religion. That's all that was left of Saul's walk at this point was a show of pretense. The real was gone. From the greatness to the gutter, it seems that time and friends and impatience and excuses and a my way attitude and jealousy and meanness and blame shifting and a, a pretense of worship had taken their toll. Saul fell from grace and was lost forever. So what happened? As we go through chapter uh, 15, we get into chapter 16. Down about verse 14 it says, But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. As we read throughout the rest of the book, we find that Saul becomes mean, mean, mean. He tries to kill David. He tries to kill his own son, Jonathan. He becomes more and more jealous, almost probably to the point of being insanely jealous. Things go from bad to worse. There is no hope. And then we come to the second scripture we read in opening. And the, when, the Lord inquired, when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord answered him not. The Lord wouldn't hear him. And so what does Saul do? He turns to witchcraft. The very thing Samuel had warned him about, probably never dreaming that that, that warning would come to pass. And many times preachers or, or somebody or marquees on a signboard will say something never having any idea that that warning will someday be needed. How could Saul go back to witchcraft? Chapter 28, verse 9 says that Saul had at one point put him out. When we're no longer restrained by God's Spirit and grace, we don't know the depths to which we'll sink. We don't know what we'll get involved with. I've got a cousin. I may have told you about him some before. He grew up, same heritage I had, spent his time in conservative holiness churches. Never yielded to God's spirit, never took opportunity to be saved. Went to Bible college at Hope Sound for a while. At some point decided he would like to be gay. And so he chose the homosexual lifestyle and he was still living at home at that time, up in his 20s, but living at home. And his preacher dad kicked him out, rightly so. 
And my cousin said, regarding his boyfriend, Dylan has brought me more happiness than Jesus ever has. Since chills down my back to think what he said and to repeat it. But at some point, Dylan beat him up. And so my cousin decided, I'll end it. And he overdosed on drugs and alcohol and tried to kill himself and failed. So he was nursed back to health. And ended up with testicular cancer. It metastasized into his lung. Uh, they cut out a big chunk of his lung. He's had been in lots of misery. And he decides, I'll try it again. Try to kill myself a second time. Well, his old praying mother and dad, Lord said, you need to go check on him. So they went to his house. and He had already overdosed, but they caught him before he died and prevented his suicide. And a little bit after that, one of his friends succeeded in killing himself. And Clayton, Clayton told his mother, he said, I saw how badly that boy's death affected his mom. I'll never put you through that. But what kind of a life must it be to be totally unrestrained by any kind of God's spirit? Only because of his praying mother and dad was his life spared the second time. And so back we see with Saul. You think, Saul, you, would, you, you got rid of that witchcraft at one time. You got rid of it back when you were in victory. Who, Saul, would you ever have thought that you would sink to that level of depravity? No, we don't know the depths we'll go if we reject God and we lose out. And so he turns to witchcraft. And what happens next, I don't understand. But Saul is told that time's up. You're going to die tomorrow. And so on tomorrow, Saul and his sons are on the battlefield. And they're fighting, and the boys are killed, and Saul is hit. And he's wounded. Our hero, this mighty man of valor who's been taller and goodlier than anybody else, he's been wounded. He's rejected God, and God has rejected him, and all hope is past. And this my way attitude is still with him, and he says, I'm going to die my way. And the Bible says he told his servant, draw a sword and kill me. And the servant wouldn't. And the Bible says that Saul took that sword and fell on it. And killed himself. No God. No grace. No hope. No life. The man Saul is no more. His my way attitude is with him even to death. I'll die my way, he said. On my sword. This morning. Like yesterday morning and tomorrow morning. Saul's in hell. The place of his very own choosing. God was going to establish his kingdom forever. If he would have only gone God's way. But he said no. I'm going my way. So where are we this morning? Are we in good victory? Are we? Is everything good between us and God? Are we fully surrendered and trusting in Him? Full of the Spirit and doing as He leads and provides opportunity for? I hope so. Or are we in the process of being tripped up? Do we recognize the spirit of my way in our lives? Are we making excuses? Are we waiting on God or taking matters into our own hands? Be careful. Many a Christian is lost out as time takes its toll. Are we blame shifting this morning? Have we lost out or have we never known victory? This day, today, this day, this morning, there's still opportunity to get it right. We've been given another opportunity for obedience. We need to obey. The songwriter said it this way. There's a line that is drawn by rejecting our Lord where the call of his spirit 
is lost. And you hurry along with the pleasure mound throng. Have you counted? Have you counted the cost? Have you counted the cost if your soul should be lost, though you gain the whole world for your own? Even now it may be that the line you have crossed, have you counted? Have you counted the cost? You may barter your hope of eternity's morn for a moment of joy at the most. For the glitter of sin and the things it will win, have you counted? Have you counted the cost? While the door of his mercy is open to you, ere the depth of his love you exhaust. Won't you come and be healed? Won't you whisper, I yield? I have counted. I have counted the cost. Have you counted the cost if your soul should be lost? Though you gain the whole world for your own, <coughs> even now it may be that the line you have crossed. Have you counted? Have you counted the cost? <coughs> I've counted the cost. It's too much of a price to pay to not walk with Jesus. I intend to go through with him. I hope we all do. Let's stand. Father, we thank you today for your spirit that's been here. Lord, you came on purpose and we're thankful for it. We've preached the word. It's about all Bible. It wasn't notions and opinions, Lord. It's been truth. There is a price to pay if we reject you. There is a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. And Lord, if anyone here needs to pray, the altar's open. They know it. They can come. And Lord God, I pray that you'll speak to who's here that needs it. Or if somebody should have been here, Lord, you gave the message on purpose. You came on purpose. Lord's been here all day today. He knew who was coming. And the last two Sundays have been Sundays of, of coming judgment, seeking God and dying in your sins, and today about rejecting the Lord and Him rejecting you. I thought I could get by without preaching this this morning about Wednesday, I realized that if I didn't, I'd be out of God's will. So I don't know if somebody here needs it, but if you do, your blood's on your hands. Your blood's on your hands. Does anybody need to pray? I would hate the thought of somebody going into judgment. God is speaking for a reason. I don't know who. Lord Jesus, we've given opportunity. If somebody's disobeyed at the throne, they'll have to give account. But Lord, we've cleared our souls. Be with us today. 